and it goes back to default mode. Not anymore. Default mode for my phone is photograph taken that way and not video or anything taken this way. So I had done the setting and then I'd run off to do something else and here I am again. Anyway, um, I'm going to have an attempt here. Uh, to, um, you know, get a bit of a show on the road, so to speak. Um, it's a bit of a traffic jam in my brain because several things at the same time. Uh, no real problems. No, I don't think so. I've um, still got a bit of rain on my glasses. But there was money involved and maybe, you know, one of the reasons why I tell my stories on this channel is that I kind of hope that at some point people actually uh, recognize patterns, you know, and then maybe they can, I don't know, have some sense of an advantage profit from what I do with my patterns, my reactions, my all that, you know, and my experiences basically. And then, um, you know, maybe it just gives people ideas. I don't know. That's the plan. So, it seems that I might actually, I don't know, but it looks like I might actually inherit a bit of money from my foster mother. Which is like jaw hitting the floor, you know. <laughs> I got this letter from a notary firm in the, in the Hague, way, you know, westward from here. People I don't know, no um, disclosure as to what the file is about, what they want me for. They want me to call them at uh, a given time in the week. So it took me about 10 minutes or so to think that maybe this has something to do with my foster mother who's passed away in uh, the end of September. And uh, it was really cool that we reconnected and there were a couple of things that were really difficult for me to deal with with respect to her and loyalty issues and all that and some of that were actually documented on my channel and I have spoken to her maybe four or five times and I made a little book of photographs for her with uh, you know my development after the period where she knew me and uh, basically, to make a long story short, at this point, um, what it feels like is that they, she really, they, or she in particular, um, it wasn't that she cared that much more, but she put more value in me being in her life. And the way life was for me had a lot of value for her, way more than any of those subjects or you know processes were actually uh, relevant for my own parents so whatever kind of money I get from her supposing that's what it is which I think I don't think I'll inherit a piano which is another possibility which is <laughs> what am I gonna do with a piano because I haven't played and I used to play I used to you know I was a really good girl so they wanted to give me piano lessons, so I practiced the piano. Because I was like, you could push me in any direction, basically. It was really easy to push me. I didn't have any will of my own. So painful. And if I inherit the piano, it's going to go being sold instantly. Because I have no, no use for a piano. <laughs> or any other musical instrument. I inherited, or I... I asked for and got violin uh, from my that used to belong to my grandmother on my mom's side uh, that she used to play when she was a young girl and I tried fiddling you know with it and that wasn't even such a complete failure even though violin violin's really hard you have to learn and you have to listen properly and it's all sorts of but you know gypsy vibrations violins that goes together really well so and still at that point and that's like 10 years ago so I uh, gave the violin away or I sold it really for a hundred florins at the time I think it was so 
I don't really see myself taking up that kind of activity where you would have to, you know, learn so many new things and it's not going to happen. The other thing being, so if the, if the thing is that I'm going to actually inherit a small sum of money, which would be nice because that would be cool and I would accept it in memory of my foster mom and in memory of what she tried to do for me and which, you know, it was only a short while. I lived them with them for five months and I don't need their money and I don't even want it, particularly because of the contrast between them and my parents, you know, all that. <sighs> But still, I will accept it and I will um, be grateful for what she tried to do for me, okay? Because it's about her, it's not about me really at that point, I think, I feel. Then having sort of had all that race through my brain in, in a couple of minutes time, or not even all of that, just a bit of that, I encounter this kind of an opposition with my husband, who finds that when it is when it comes to matters of money he has to obligatorily have a say in whatever it is that I'm doing and thinking and deciding and I went nuts <laughs> because personal sovereignty you know and all that and agency and I mean after having sort of argued and or discussed about this all weekend long we uh, it, it it sort of dawned on me that there are a couple of issues here where basically he's remembering his parents which is a different story from mine and it's just as miserable <laughs> he remembers that whenever his mother had money his dad was kind of desperate to you know keep the rent paid and kids boots and all that stuff and mum went off and bought, bought paints for herself or she went to visit an artist friend at the other side of the country to, you know, she just spent it all. And it was a given in their household that mum had what they call in Dutch a hole in her hand, like, like that, where money just fell through and disappeared. <laughs> That's a Dutch expression. Having a hole in your hand, it's, it's, it means that you cannot hold on to any money ever without spending it immediately. Now, apparently for my husband, that tends to be rather an issue. It's not that he doesn't even, you know, trust me or that he doesn't want to let me have what, I, what, what I'm owed or what is my responsibility, basically. He wants me to be a free agent. But this is so ingrained in him and so, mm, it has, I, it used to have such a hold on him. It was a really good weekend in that respect in that after all this discussion and all this thinking about things on both sides, um, this is what com comes out basically. And he feels like uh, he doesn't have any value in my life, which is like <gasps> horrible, you know, because I mean, I walk around I'll tell you the rest of the story, okay? Let me just tell you. Because over the phone just now, I said, uh, look, um, regardless more or less of how much money I'm actually going to get, of course, that has consequences when it's, if it's 200 different from when it's 2000 euros. In both cases, there are things that need to be done or things that we may choose to do. Um, in any of those scenarios, I asked him, what do you think is at the top of my little list here that I made for things that I think are clever to uh, use this money for? What do you think? What do you think is at the top of my list? He didn't know. He said, yes, well, maybe to, you know, go off, have a weekend together or go to a restaurant or go blah, 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 be together and all that type of stuff. Which is kind of interesting because that's his projection on the situation. It's what he would have done in my situation with his background, with his memories of his dad being like, oh my God, I need this money for the rent and I need this money for the kids' boots and all that. I said, no. What's actually, after we'd argued and, you know, been at each other's throats most for some of the time, what's at the top of my list is your shirt because he needs, you know, nice office shirts. Those, those that he got are uh, a bit on the, you know, 
They're guessing he he's worn the same shirts for a couple of years now, and he needs new shirts. Because I want to be responsible. This is what happens if you allow me to be responsible for my own things and allow me to basically um, have my you know have my thoughts about this type of stuff, organize my thoughts. And yes, I want to go to Amsterdam and have a have a meal with my husband and buy candles and maybe buy my tarot deck or maybe visit a Jewish museum that I can uh, can think of. You know, there's those things as well. But then it depends. It depends on on the amount basically. So I will know more about this. Of course, he was impressed that the shirts were at the top of the list. Yes, he was. <laughs> he didn't expect that. He cannot predict that type of thing. He doesn't know me. <laughs> After 32 years, he still doesn't know me. Isn't that crazy? So I'm understanding a lot more and a lot better and a lot deeper, I think. And um, slowly we're, uh, yeah figuring this out. So it's not like uh, it's the end of the world. It looked like a bit like the end of the world on Sunday morning because we were both angry and upset because neither of us trusted the other one. Hmm? So that sucks. Yeah, it was quite a bit of a, it was a weird weekend. And after all the, uh, all the things, we did a couple of other things. We had a, a really good activity that I'd planned in the week before. Um, this, this, there's this big sliding door here that you've seen a couple of times in my videos. That's basically the whole back of my room is glass and it has a wooden frame and it can slide open like this, you know, halfway. And, um, I, I usually have in the summertime, I have, or I used to have always, uh, fairly thin type curtains in, uh, in that, uh, in that window. And actually... In the summer, that's perfect. Actually, now it would still have been okay. But in the winter, especially when the temperature is below, below freezing during the nighttime, or it's plus three to five degrees like it was last week for, uh, you know, for a bit, a couple of days, really, then uh, that's really cold because there's the, the sliding doors have like a draft uh, coming through on practically three sides basically wherever you can have an opening there's it's open it's old the wood is kind of um twisted a bit so yeah instead of having proper straight lines adjusted like that it's kind of like this so there's massive draft so i had two really gorgeous old velvet curtains still from my old house uh that had been in use in that house but they were different curtains different from each other okay so one of them was like a really long tall uh, curtain that used to be behind our front door in the old house and so it was really tall you know big enough and I could just I've washed them both because they're you know cotton velvet I could uh, just stick them in the washing machine over here and that was fine and I did that during the week past and um, not a problem very easy very nice color the other one was broader in dimension and shorter by about 50 centimeters or so so I did have another type of fabric actually another curtain that my friend uh, made for me one time for the old house also to hang in a in a, in a door in a doorway um, that house Let's not go there, shush. Because um, actually I've never hung it up, that curtain that she made for me. And um, it was still in my boxes uh, in the attic, you know. So now what I've done is I attached uh, this a length, actually the whole length of this uh, other different type fabric. It looks really good. It's compatible colors, you know, it's really pretty. Um, plus a small bit, about 60 centimeters or so, that I needed extra. Sewed those together and attached the whole length of that to the bottom of the second velvet curtain. I'm going to show it to you. Hang on a second. So this is the, the normal curtain as it always has been, okay? And this is what's happening at the bottom end now. 
I think that's actually rather nice. But the challenge, of course, was to get that uh, sewn up properly. And having, you know, three and a half, what was it, meters uh, pinned together of really heavy, you know, clumsy, large, uh, massive f curtain fabric, that was a challenge. So I'm going to stick you back where you belong, over here, like so. And um, so as long as there were pins in there, it was like a danger zone, a danger area, because I was <laughs> cursing and shouting the whole time, uh, up until the moment where it had all been, you know, stitched together properly. I've got a really good sewing machine, it's ancient, that I inherited also from somebody else. And it sees me through this type of, uh, of work really well. So, um, yeah, yay us, I think, and husband helped uh, quite a bit to also hang it all up and all that. It's nice and clean. Everything uh, really fits really well. It's the curtains are a bit on the long side, but it will keep the cold out all the way. And uh, my cats love it. They're already, you know, sleep on the floor next to or curled up halfway into those uh, folds of those curtains. So it's going to be, it's already so much cozier in the house than uh, especially downstairs here because in the ground floor outside is just, you know, garden, it's nature. Basically, and even though we are in a row of little houses, little, fairly okay, big size houses, I think, compared to some people's, uh, I have neighbours on both sides, but the ground floor tends to stay colder. So, yeah, so all's well, all that we did together on Saturday. And after we had stopped arguing on Sunday, we went to the book fair which is always something that happens in the next town, actually the town where we used to live before we came here, uh, that we've gone to, I think, every year, almost every year, for at least 10 years or so. The second-hand book fair, which takes place for, I think, three days, Friday, Saturday and Sunday, um, in that town in the, the first weekend of November, always. And so I have a book haul, which is kind of cool, which I want to share with you guys. To begin with, I have this hefty fellow. Three languages, Dutch, English and Francais. This is Les Orchidées de France. And it's like that much <laughs> of a book. I looked it up online and it's uh, 45 euros uh, normal sh price, you know, normal bookshop price. And this is what's inside. Like endless photographs, endless close-ups of wild orchids as they grow, uh, basically also in the west of uh, in the west of Europe. Um, I think in the east of Europe you have plenty of these as well. These are uh, you must realize that if you look at this, okay, this is I think slightly larger. This plant here is slightly larger than life size, maybe less than twice. So it will be this thing. In real life, it will be about this big, and the uh, so the flowers themselves are about this between one and two centimeters, so something along those lines. Gorgeous book. I haven't even looked at everything properly because I've got a pile of others, and it's all about all the different types there are. Really detailed, lots of all the different types, Latin names up to here. Um, all about the, you know, the, the places where they grow, little maps where they, where these pl flowers occur and all that. And the orchids in Europe, um, are in danger because they grow in fields, basically in the sunshine where, uh, there's livestock, but not too much of it and not too, um, it's not that you can't have like herbicides and uh, pest uh, control and that type of stuff. They have to, they live, the orchids live and thrive in um, the old style um, farming land, you know? So loads of those, some of those actually grow nearby here as well. Let me see whether I can find one. 
Uh, this is a type, for example, oh, this book weighs a ton. It's like five kilos or something. That's what these look like. These grow in my village here, actually, uh, in the summertime. This is what the flowers look like. And they're also like, in real life, this thing is like one centimeter, so it's like tiny. They're gorgeous. They're beautiful, and I love them. I've always loved them. I discovered these. There's another little story attached to that. So let me <laughs> get some breath back in. Um, I discovered these in the south of Spain when I was 12 years old. I think I've spoken about this on my channel before because I was in a state of rapture, I think. They're in here as well. The bee orchis. It looks... Yes, almost there. Okie dokie. Things... No, that's not it. Almost. Apifera. The bee orchis. <laughs> Can't find it now. I'm showing, I'm showing you these. This is more or less what it looks like. Uh, I found about 20 or so plants of this in the grass field by the flat where my mum and I used to live back in those days. So this was in like 79 or so. 1979. And the stalks are like this big with about five, four or five flowers on them and a couple of buds. And I was in a state. I was... I was in rapture, I was in ecstasy over how pretty they were. And the next morning I came back and they'd mown the lawn. And they were gone. Disappeared. Nothing of them ever to be found again. And I only lived there for, you know, a year, less than a year. So I've never been able to go back. And it was, dev it was devastated, of course. It was one of those moments where I had found something in the world that was really something I could love. And the very next day, it was taken away. So, I love me this stuff. I know also, now, I comfort myself thinking that um, those plants actually grow from a bulb inside the ground. And as long as they don't touch that, the orchids will come up again as soon as possible, you know. And they will flower again after, after a while. And uh, I haven't seen that, of course, myself. But... Um, as long as you don't take up all, all the earth and, and sort of, you know, m make it impossible for the mush for the mushroom for the orchids to live, then uh, they will come back. They're quite hardy and persistent. So that's one book, one really great haul. I got me a couple of kids' books, not that interesting. I think a couple of Enid Blytons, you know, who cares? It's just too, quite okay after all the complicated business, also with. The moon in Capricorn with Saturn and Pluto and all that. Oh, it's, just, it's quite okay to just lie on the couch and read any Blyton as far as I'm concerned. Uh, this is more or less the same type of vibration. I have got a Dutch version and it looks so dirty and grimy. Uh, the cards tell your future too. And this is by Cecily Kent or Cicely, I should say. Sicily Kent and there's actually what's cool is I actually got a probably uh, <laughs> I've no idea what this is the hand is a mirror of your personality episode number two Eric Madon a chirologist it's there's a little a uh, document like so in here that has uh, a description and details about the character line in uh, you know ha palm reading palmistry uh, little uh, document like so that was that I found stuck in this booklet and there's the um, receipt from the bookshop also in The Hague by the way which got itself the book got itself all the way over here uh, and the date on the receipt is 1951, so the book is older than that. I've no idea how um, well known this book is, how well known this author is. I haven't looked anything up yet. There's actually the cards 
it's also about Ouija boards and about tarot a bit, but it basically works with playing cards. So that's why I bought it, because uh, it also has, you know, like little spreads and things like that, that I don't know uh, anything about so far. Different spreads with using playing cards. So I thought that was rather, um, rather cool. I will uh, park this for now, because no brain, but as soon as my brain's back online, this is one of the first things that I'm going to have a look at. Another cool book. This one's in English. Magic is all around us. All we need is the ability to see and understand. Oh, that's probably about another title. Age of Aquarius. Anyway, Michael Howes wrote Amulets. And it has all sorts of illustrations as well. Um, about all sorts of symbols the people carried around amulets from Africa, the South Seas and the Americas, Buddhas, I Ching sticks, coins and all that. Magical use of objects like so. I thought that was irresistible. Then I still have Music and the Celtic Otherworld by Karen Rowles McLeod, like so, which I thought was pretty nice. And a, a Dutch book, again, about the Jewish tradition as permanent learning. It looks like this is somebody's thesis or a treatise of some sort. The font in this is a bit weird, a bit unusual. But there's loads of Torah in here and Talmud and bits and commentary and stuff like that. And since this is the day, the Sunday, the last day of the book fair, is actually a day where you pay... A euro a kilo or two euros a kilo something like that we'd spent 25 euros in all for our books mm. and i think we had 31 volumes because my husband had yay big a pile of uh, of his uh, you know thrillers cr cr crimin criminal novels and stuff like that so gray hall you know and um i wasn't expecting anything i was completely exhausted by the time we got there i was just oh, you know, I felt like whatever, and I know it's only one time a year that I actually get to go to this place. So, um, let's just, you know, <laughs> be, <laughs> be brave and, you know, keep at it. And then, in the end, you find all sorts of great stuff, always. Even in a small town in the middle of nowhere, really, basically, which I'm quite surprised at. There's hardly ever any metaphysical books or any of it so this is this was quite a find the cards um card slinging book and the amulets book both of them it's really extraordinary to find those so and the orchids really also got this which is my favorite uh children's book uh type of a compilation this is uh something i've never talked to you about yet i think um this is from a television series that they made in the 70s. I think this is from 75 with puppets. And this is Paulus himself, like that. Uh, the author originally uh, made lots of pen drawings with this. And I've got uh, loads of those books and they're awesome. And uh, I still love them very much there. He used, um, he's, he's got really funny sense of humor. There's a witch in the stories, of course. This is the witch. Eucalypta, with her all-seeing eye device, like that. So this is a bit, it's a bit more on the silly side, this, and in the, um, in, in the versions where the stories are actually drawn and there's actually a text that you read, they're a bit more, um, slightly more, I don't know, refined or sometimes special in a way. It's something I grew up with. One of the very few stable factors in my life, you know? Okay, so that was my book haul. And I think I said enough also about the other issues at hand. I said just now, yes, uh, the moon was in Capricorn and there was a bit of a hard time. Actually, I'm wearing the Tektite again with the two tubes of um, Amanita wax on there. I've worn them for a couple of hours. 
and maybe that's enough already i'm really dosing so to speak on the on the tech tight um but this morning i was feeling so tired and so generally you know too much emotion too much emotion does that to me and i just uh, don't know where i am anymore and i just uh uh, I also have to do a couple of practical things, basically. So, yeah. There you go. Change the bed, hoovering, laundry, that type of stuff. So, thank you so much for watching, if you stuck along. Oh, yeah, I do have 50 subscribers. Isn't that extraordinary? I have done nothing to promote my channel, I think, other than just be here and be as cool as I can. <laughs> you know? And here are 50 subscribers, and that was my target for the end of the year basically to uh, see whether I could you know whether that was going to happen so all those people thank you and you just came here and stayed basically many of them at least stayed because you like what you get over here so thank you for that and uh, thank you for watching and I will be back again quite soon okay thank you see you soon ciao